Thank you so much, uh, Pooja, Rohan, and all the young ophthalmologists uh, for allowing me into this. As Himanshu said, I think this has been a wonderful series and not just the youngsters, but many of us could have also learned from this. It's indeed a privilege to be interacting in this forum with the youngsters. I'm sure the future of ophthalmology for India is extremely bright and it lies in your hands and it's truly a golden opportunity to meet you all. I hope this uh, interaction continues in the times to come. Pooja initially uh, contacted me. She said, talk about the modern intraocular lens formulae. But then when she said that, told me about the target audience, I said, instead of going on to some details, some theoretical details about uh, what uh, the different uh, recent formulae entail, I'll go to what exactly we are practicing, not just in our primary centers, but across all our centers and what's worked for us very well for in the last uh, five to six years. Uh, by way of financial disclosure, as, well, uh, as far as this presentation is concerned, there's nothing relevant. We have been presenting on this almost for a couple of decades now and about seven, eight years back when we used to start our presentation. This was uh, usually the most common slide that was being used. And you can see here the holiday two, uh, about five years back with seven different variables that used to be incorporated in them was my go-to formula. Was giving me pretty good results. And all these formula is capable of giving reasonable results when the axial length is in the range of about 22 to 24.5 millimeters, which will be the case in about 80 to 85 percent of the eyes that we handle. So obviously, there are outliers, and this topic is essentially about how exactly we deal with them. And uh, nowadays, it's uh, given up as far as talking about generations of formula is concerned, is more understanding the basics of how the formula, each formula works. And you have the Barrett 2, the Olsen, the Hill RBF, the Kane, Lattice, etc. And if I had to cover the initial topic that uh, Pooja gave me, I would have had to talk about all these formula. But uh, I thought that this would just give an add to the baggage that you are already exposed to, but rather talk about exactly what we ourselves use, and that's the Barrett Suter formula. Why exactly we talk about these uh, uh, later iterations of the formula is because those 20% of the cases that are unusual by way of being a short or long eyes, or by way of having a refractive surgery done earlier, then these are the uh, eyes which essentially are outliers. If you look at the, my favorite, the Barrett, which is this over here, you can see that across the spectrum of intraocular lens power, which is plus six diopters or plus 30 diopters, it lies within a refractive accuracy of about 0.25 plus or minus 0.25 diopters in majority of the patients who undergo an uneventful cataract surgery. When you come across some of the other good formulae, you do find that there are significant outliers when you come across instances where a high powered or a low powered intraocular lens has to be implanted. So when I talk about the Barrett Suter formulae, is essentially is an integration of five different formula. The Barrett Universal 2, which is the mother formula, which is the core formula at the heart of all the other iterations that need to follow. And I would be dwelling upon this in a little bit in detail. The Barrett Toric Calculator, which is what we use for a Toric intraocular lens power calculation. For that matter, whenever a patient uh, agrees for a cataract surgery, the first thing my counselor does is to go to this Barrett Toric Calculator and determine whether the patient requires a Toric intraocular lens. If in case a T3, T4, or plus 1.5 uh, diopter intraocular lens is needed with a toricity incorporated in it, then all the counseling is about a toric multifocal or a tonic monofocal. The reason we have switched over to this is that in case you have counseled the patient earlier, patient has agreed for a multifocal or LRCS, and subsequently you determine that the patient has significant cylinder on the anterior corneal surface, then it's a little difficult to go back to the patient and change your counseling to toric intraocular lens. So essentially, this is my go-to formula, the first formula that we use whenever a patient agreed for a cataract surgery. Then, of course, you have the Barrett 2K formula. Basically, all of us have been doing a significant amount of laser vision correction. And this gives excellent results as far as uh, uh, post-refractive surgery patients are concerned. And in case you decide to go ahead and implant a toric and trochal lens in a patient of post-refractive surgery, then this is a Barrett 2K toric is the formula. And in case you have a refractive surprise subsequent to implantation of toric and trochal lens, then you might have to rotate the lens, exchange the lens, or add on the lens. And then when you use this Barrett RX formula, that gives you the results that you want. What exactly is the Barrett Universal 2 formula, which is the basic formula on which all these other formula are built upon, is a theoretical Gaussian formula, which is based upon ray tracing principles. And that considers the principal plane of the intraocular lens that you have implanted. And it is said to be a thick lens formula, which individualizes the effective lens position for each individual lens. 
I'm sure many of these things did not make too much sense for you. Let's try to dissect it out and understand it a little bit more. What do I mean by a thick lens formula? Basically, all the other formula that we use, you are a thin lens formula. And when they talk about, talk about lens thickness, it alludes to the lens which we remove. That is a cataractous lens which is there in the eye already. But this is a formula which takes into consideration the profile and the thickness of the lens that we are implanting. And all the other formula, the so-called thin lens formula, consider the intraocular lens formula to be an infinitely thin planar lens that does not take into consideration the thickness of the profile of the lens. As you can see here, most often the lens we implant is a biconvex lens, but when it becomes a slightly lower power lenses like a plus four diopter, plus six diopter, etc., it becomes plano convex. And when it comes on to the negative lenses or even the low power plus lenses in some companies, it becomes a meniscus lens. A meniscus lens is a lens where the anterior surface is uh, convex and the posterior surface is concave. And the same power of the intraocular lens could be determined by a various combinations. As you can see over here, if you want a minus four diopter lens, which is extreme myopia, you can see it could have a plus four diopter in the anterior surface and a minus eight diopters in the posterior surface, which is a concave. And you could have a zero diopter planar surface anteriorly, a minus four diopter posterior aspect. So depending upon the company that lens that you're using, the intraocular lens for the same power might be of a different thickness and might have a different profile. And the incorporation of this, that is the profile of the lens that you are implanting in the eye, that is what differentiates the, power, the formula. And that is the reason you do not require the Bangkok modification for the uh, SRKT formula or certain extremes that the Haggis formula uses when you go on to extremes of eye like the, uh, the different A constants that, that are used when you go on to extreme powers. That is because the profile and the thickness of the lens that is implanted is incorporated per se in this formula. And how does this do it? Uh, basically, the, uh, for predicting the effective lens position, which is the holy grail of any formula that you use, these are the parameters the param direct suit takes into consideration. The axial length, the corneal power, the anterior chamber depth, the white to white and the lens thickness. In case you have only these three parameters, because I believe I'm also talking to some basic audience, even these three suffice, but you are able to add on these two, then it might be uh, further icing on the cake as far as the accuracy of this formula is concerned. As I said, these are the three formula that's incorporated in various optical biometers, but you have to go on to the website for accessing these two formula. And one fact, one thing that you need to understand is the fact, lens factor. It's something like the A constant, even if you have the A constant of a particular intraocular lens, it's possible to derive the lens factor. And that is essentially the distance between the iris plane and the posterior principal plane of the intraocular lens. Every intraocular lens that you implant has a posterior uh, principal plane, which is on by going across the posterior surface, the lens and the anterior principal plane. And it is a distance between the iris plane and the posterior principal plane of the intraocular lens. The other factor is called the design factor. And this is essentially the design factor. And what do you essentially mean by, what do you mean by the design factor? That is the power at which the lens transforms from a biconvex lens to the meniscus. And this is essentially given by the company which makes the intraocular lens. For example, for all the Alcon intraocular lenses, the conversion from a biconvex to a meniscus happens at the power of plus five. But on the other hand, for Zeiss, it happens at plus at zero power. If you had to talk about a technic group of lenses, it is at four diopters. This design factor is available even for our Indian intraocular lenses per se, and this is what is being used widely. And uh, I forgot to mention this. As far as this uh, factor is concerned, that's the lens factor. This is again, that's something determined, and it has a relationship to the A constant, but it's quite different from the A constant. You can derive it from the A constant, but then each prominent company manufacturer of intraocular lens has also this lens factor, which is incorporated in this barrett shooter formula. Why do I, it's called universal? Why do I say it's a go-to formula? Because almost the entire spectrum of intraocular lens that you might have to implant, whether it's the axial length of 12 to 38 millimeters, whether it's a K reading of 35 to average K of 35 to 55 diopters, optical ACD of zero to six millimeters, refraction from minus 10 to plus 10 diopters um, preoperatively, lens thickness of two to eight millimeters. That's a, the, the actual lens thickness which you are removing white to white of eight to 14 millimeters. All this range can be completely covered by the Barrett Universal 2 formula. And where exactly it's available? It's available in most of the currently used optical biometers. 
but I do understand that all, not every one of us has access to an optical biometer. And it's also available in the ACRS and APACRS websites. Even if you're not a member of these societies, you can access this free of charge and it's available right on the um, opening page of these websites. We'll be having a look at that. And depending upon whether you mentioned it's a post-refractive surgery or without a refractive surgery, whether it's a toric intraocular lens or a, um, a monofocal intraocular lens that you implant, the formula in these optical biometers is pre-selected depending upon, upon your requirement that you initially choose. And this is what I was talking about on the home page of the APACRS as well as the ACRS website. You have this uh, uh, icon called IOL formula. Why, once you uh, click on this, you have this drop down menu. And even though these two are not available in most of the optical biometers, the entire spectrum of uh, formula is available for our usage. And that's exactly what we have. As was Pooja was mentioning, we have about 13 centers now. In 10 of them, we have optical biometers. But even in those centers where we do not have access to optical biometers, we use an immersion A scan, usually to get two consistent data. And then subsequently, the ophthalmologist, the cataract surgeon goes on to the, or rather the biometrist goes on to the uh, APSRS website and loads these data inside to go ahead and calculate the exact precise intraocular lens power that needs to be um, implanted. Now, coming on to the Barrett toric calculator, why is it so important and what are the extra things that it incorporates over the Barrett Universal 2? It takes into consideration the posterior corneal astigmatism. As we all know, this is most often a negative corneal astigmatism and it's mathematically derived in the formula. You are also able to measure the posterior corneal astigmatism by using a sweat source UCT of IOL Master 700, which also has incorporated in it a telecentric keratometry. But it has been found that whether you mathematically derive as in the original Barrett toric calculator or feed in the uh, posterior corneal astigmatism as in the Barrett toric TK formula, as far as the ultimate outcome is concerned, it's a little different. So even though you may not be able to measure the posterior corneal astigmatism, still you can use the mathematically derived posterior corneal astigmatism without any compromise in the results. The other important factor that you can feed in is the surgically induced astigmatism. We often used to believe that the temporal clear corneal incision, a 2.4 millimeter incision, creates an astigmatism of about 0.4 to 0.5 diopters. And that's what I used to measure it as 0.47 diopters for my incision on the Hill SIA calculator. But now we know that it has both the direction and the magnitude and the SIA is most often 0.1 diopter. Please, mind you, whenever you are using a toric calculator, even if you are not using a Barrett toric calculator, if you are using a 2.4 millimeter or less than that, if the SIA for a temporal clear corneal incision is 0.1 diopter. If you are using a 2.8 or a 3 diopter, is 0.25 diopters. The toricity ratio, depending upon the basic intraocular lens power that you are uh, facing, uh, putting in, that is a spherical power, for a, whether it's a plus 1 diopter or a plus 30 diopter, the impact of the toricity on the corneal surface is quite different. For example, if it's a plus 30 diopter, you require almost about just about 1.29 diopters in the intraocular lens for a toricity of one diopter on the anterior corneal surface. But if it's a plus 6 diopter, you require about 1.86 diopters toricity in the intraocular lens for reflecting a one diopter power on the corneal surface. This is something again incorporated in the formula per se. There are various tables that are available. You need not even look, look at them. You need not even memorize them. It's automatically incorporated. Again, there is a variable K index depending upon which instrument that you are using uh, as far as the intraocular, as far as the K readings measurement is concerned. As you can see over here, this is just an Alcon toric calculator. This is just one example. Various other formulae that are available, and this is one of the commonly used formula. Let us see as to how does it incorporate the various factors as I mentioned. As you can see over here, once you feed in the axial lens, the anterior chamber depth, the basic spherical power of the intraocular lens, this helps you determine the formula by an allegorically calculates the toricity of the intraocular lens that needs to be uh, placed, depending upon whether it's a 6 diopter, 20 diopter, or 35 diopter intraocular lens. And as I already mentioned, the induced corneal astigmatism for this toric intraocular lens is just for about 0.1 diopter. And the company which, which gives you the auto refractometer, auto keratometer, or the IOL master, or the lens star, will tell you what exactly is the K index that needs to be incorporated. Once you uh, vary this, again, the intraocular lens power calculation becomes significantly better. As I mentioned, what about post refractive surgery scenario? Whether it's post laser vision correction, post radial keratotomy, 
with or without the preoperative data being available, you are able to exactly calculate the intraocular lens power. We have been using this for almost the last five to six years. It's not as if that we have not had no refractive surprises, but it's quite minimal. And this has been well documented by with several studies, both in the, uh, America, uh, the North America, the Europe, and also Asia Pacific region. And that's the reason that there's so many studies that have uh, documented the outcomes of this uh, formula that I'm not really quoting any specific study. The mathematical basis of the barrett rookie formula has not been published. It's something which is in the mind, which, but as Barrett himself understands, it essentially uses the double K solutions and mathematically derives the modified K depending upon the original power that has been corrected, whether you are able to determine that or not, the relationship between the uh, anterior corneal surface and the posterior corneal surface, and thus determines the modified K. And that's what is incorporated in the Barrett true K formula. And as I mentioned, this is a unique formula where if you want to implant a toric intraocular lens, subsequent laser vision correction or a radial keratotomy, you, this formula helps you to determine that. Uh, implantation of a toric intraocular lens, subsequent uh, um, uh, refractive surgery itself is a relative no-no because you implant a toric intraocular lens only when the toricity on the anterior corneal surface or the, is orthogonal, that is at 90 degrees to each other. But in case we go into greater detail, it's possible to... Uh, implant these lenses in certain specific instances when the toricity is adequately taken care of by the spectacle correction initially. So in case you want to implant that, this is the go-to formula. And th there is often a question that is asked that if your different uh, um, instrument that you use, maybe a topographer, maybe a lens star, maybe IOL master or just a auto K and uh, the instrument uh, gives you different readings, how exactly you determine, which is quite right. Basically, uh, it was thought that you de determine the magnitude from the keratometer and use the axis from the topographer. But I think this is uh, conceptually quite wrong because it's like uh, combining apples and oranges where you get measurements of the same formula for two different instruments. So essentially what we do in this is uh, we go ahead and use what's called a Barrett RX formula. How exactly you access this when you go on to the, uh, this is not available with any uh, <clears throat> any optical biometer, you have to essentially go on to the ACLS at APACLS website. If you click on this K calculator, then it uh, after three uh, uh, feeding in the primary data, then you would uh, drop, you'll get this drop down menu and where you can uh, feed in the different instruments. Supposing you have used a Lenstar, uh, IOL Master 700 and a manual keratometer, each of these can be fed in. And then subsequently it takes the median of these three calculations. The advantage of the median is that it, go uh, it uh, denies the outliers and that the uh, thus improving the accuracy of the formula what barrett himself has found is that if you use just one instrument as far as the toricity being less than 0.5 doctors in the post operative period is concerned it's in the range of about 67 percent it is in a, a series of about 212 eyes that he did if it's a two instrument it's in the range of about 76 percent where it's a mean calculation that taken into consideration if it's a median where three instruments have been used it improves to about 81.5 percent I would not really be able to tell you what exactly is this median calcula calculation, just like the uh, post uh, the toric calculator for post refractive surgery, the formula itself eliminates outliers that's improving the accuracy. And in case you have a refractive surprise, subsequent implantation of the intraocular lens, uh, which is a toric intraocular lens, there are various ways you could address it. Most often it's intraocular lens rotation. You could exchange it or you could have a piggyback lens being implanted. Essentially, this is our own calculation that we use. Yeah, earlier, we were using the astigmatismfix.com formula, but now I find that this works very well. As you can see here, the patient got a plus 24 diopter lens with a toricity of T4, and the residual astigmatism was plus 1 with a minus 2.5 diopters. Whenever the spherical equivalent of the toricity that's left behind, whether it's a toric intraocular lens or a toric ICL, is almost zero. You can see that uh, it cancels out each other. That is when the rotation of the intraocular lens is going to work. Because when you rotate the lens, you're not introducing any power, but you're just redistributing the power. And when I have a situation like this, this formula tells me how much exactly I have to rotate my lens. As you can see over here, my 24 diopter T4 toric lens has to be changed from a 6 degree, uh, degree axis to a 176 degree axis. And the residual astigmatism that's left behind is also given, uh, given this formula. In case you have, a, as I mentioned, this formula, the rotation will work only with the 
residual astigmatism spherical equivalent is almost zero. But if you have a situation like this, where you have just about minus two diopters of uh, uh, 90 degrees astigmatism left behind, or a minus two sphere left behind, if the basic intraocular lens that has been implanted is wrong, so this formula will give you what exactly is the lens power that needs to be exchanged. The new lens that has to be implanted after taking out the lens which is already there. And in case you have a, a lens which has been implanted years back, the patient has come to you for secondary surgery, you know that this is the residual astigmatism that the patient has and the spherical power. This formula again gives you the power of the piggyback intraocular lens that needs to be implanted. As was said by Himanshu, I think all the information that I'm rapidly going through, not so rapidly you might think, uh, may not be understandable in one sitting. Maybe you have to uh, go on to multiple iterations of these presentations, maybe listen to many others to understand this. But once you have understood this, uh, you would uh, enjoy using this formula. And that's exactly what's happening to us. As, we, as was mentioned during the introduction, accurate biometry is of paramount importance. And as future ophthalmologists, as ophthalmologists, cataract surgeons of the third millennium, you owe it to your patients to hit emetropia, not just for distance alone, but for near and intermediate also. Using optical or immersion biometer in the most optimal manner, they are using the right formula. Uh, in my case, is the Barrett uh, suitor formula. It's possible to achieve stellar outcomes in almost each and every one of your cataract surgery. Thank you so much for your kind attention. This is just a picture of mine with uh, Chitra and mine with uh, uh, Dr. Graham Barrett. This is well known to me, though he may not know so, me so well. But I really uh, hats off to this gentleman who has done so much to change the uh, scenario of uh, biometry in the past few years. Thank you so much. Yeah, brilliant, Ramu. That, Dr. Ramurthy, that was absolutely fantastic. The real perspective, friends, again, I repeat at the cost of repetition, all those going through this, and if you're really new to this, you might have to go through this quite a few times to understand the depth of every statement that he has made. Uh, if you don't have an updated IOL 700, IOL Master 700 or a Lenstar updated, don't worry, these formula are free of charge without becoming a member of the ASCRS or the APICRS. You could avail of these formulae. You may have, because of restrictions, you may have a previous formula in your machine, but this is easily available. And what Dr. Ramurti has given you is directly cutting short all the clutter. What is the best approach now? And Graham Barrett, that photograph should be in your mind. He's the man who has revolutionized modern day biometry and which lens to use. Thank you so much, Ramu. What is go to formula? Let's ask all our faculty what, are, what their go to formula is. That would be nice to see. No, no, actually, since we are talking to the youngsters, I think probably what Dr. Ramurti said is something very pertinent that no, never a contact biometry it has to be immersion. I think most of the biometry machines, I mean, A-scan machines will have an immersion part. I think most of them is never used. I've seen across institutions, it is not basically, you know, uh, they don't stick to that. And it's not basically, there's no compulsion to use a immersion. I think that is something that everybody probably has to do. I think the least that a postgraduate can do, a beginner can do is immersion. I think till they probably get hands on, I mean, hands on their optical biometer. I think Dr. Ramamurthy, uh, if you do not have an optical biometer, what do you tell the postgraduates to do? Well, I think the immersion A-scan works very well, extremely well. You know, the only difference between an optical biometer and an immersion A-scan is optical biometer is relatively idiot-proof in the sense that you could have a somewhat of an untrained uh, biometrist and maybe, and it, especially in the normal eyes, uh, not the eyes with extreme stepeloma or abnormal eyes, they could get reasonably good readings. But if, uh, if it's a biometrist or a doctor, a young doctor who's uh, uh, doing his immersion A-scan, uh, then if he or she is doing it properly, taking all the precautions uh, with the patient lying down, and uh, they can get extremely repeatable readings. And mind you, it's not the axial length, it's more often the keratometry readings, which gives you uh, fallacies as far as the intraocular lens power calculation is concerned. And if you are using a good instrument, even a good auto keratometer, even a manual keratometer, which is calibrated on a daily basis, it's possible to get excellent outcomes. When we got our first optical biometer, we were not believing it. We were actually going cross-checking our readings with the immersion A scan. We, what we found was quite often, it took us quite some years to give up immersion A scan and just go with our optical biometry because our faith was more with the immersion A scan. And it, the initial three, four years, it was always both the instruments. And then subsequently, we thought, okay, this all instrument also works. So please do not wait for going on to toric intraocular lenses, multifocal intraocular lenses, or aiming emetropia for even your monofocal patients for getting an optical biometer. Uh, I think you can very well go ahead and implant these lenses. But having said that, if I were to choose between upgrading my basic FACO machine to a higher-end FACO machine, 
or getting an optical biometer. I think subsequently this is going to be covered. Sorry for encroaching on this. I would opt for going on for an optical biometer because I think that is good value for money. But then do not wait for uh, getting one. Doctor. I think that's a very pertinent point, the keratometry, because many of the postgraduates are doing it. The patient is probably very tall or very short. There's actually a tilting of the head. So many times to reach up to the keratometer, there is actually a small tilting, which the axis can go really haywire. I think that is very important and also trying to maintain a good ocular surface. They have done a contact uh, procedure, like an application or something, and they do a biometry later, get a keratometry reading. I think this is probably very, very important. Keratometry is a, also a major source of error. Uh, I mean, as good as, you know, axial length. I think that's a very good point uh, brought out by Dr. Ramamurthy. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask you that uh, you showed five variables for the Barrett's and, uh, you know, out of which three are easily possible on, uh, you know, using any of the things and, you know, the other two variables. So how, what difference does that make? Like to what percentage would it make a difference to your, uh, you know, emetropia outcomes if you were to integrate all the five variables? Uh, frankly, uh, Garo, I mean, you know, uh, having access to instruments, which gives me the other two variables also, I have been using all the other five, all the five variables, and for that matter, most of your optical biometers will automatically give you this information. But what I have heard in Dr. Graham Barrett's talks is that even if you do not have access to the other two, you know, it's all the, uh, for example, the axial length and the uh, K readings are the most important uh, parameters. And then because the earlier formula just take into consideration anterior chamber depth as a ratio of the axial length, if you measure the anterior chamber depth and feed that in then again, the accuracy of the formula uh, significantly improves. The other two variables, the white to white and the other variable is not really so important. If you have them, the lens thickness and the white to white, okay. lens thickness, mind you, is the thickness of the lens that you're taking out will be of a less, lesser importance. So just in case you do not have them, still you can go ahead and enjoy the benefits of this formula. I personally do not have uh, experience of using this, nor have I come across a comparative paper between using these three and five. But I've heard Graham Barrett mentioning that uh, even though you may have access to only the initial three, still the accuracy will be pretty good. Yeah, that's the beauty of his mathematical formula. You know, you have the regression formula by Hill RBF. You have various kinds of formula the mathematicians have put up. But this is a formula which really with minimum data can give you a lovely answer. Very true. So getting your axial length and keratometry is the most important. Your posterior cornea, you may or may not have. Your uh, lens thickness, you may or may not have, but still Barrett gives you a fantastic answer. Dr. Partha, quick one. Yeah. So a quick one, and I, I think a very basic question uh, that we all need to answer and we all need to reinstate basically is when to do a biometry. If a cataract patient walks in and is getting a workup done, so when to do the biometry? So here, you know, I would uh, really reinstate things that we have discussed in the past that before an applanation, before that, Paracane, proparacane drop is put for the eye before a dilatation is done for the eye. The biometry should be done as soon as possible and then going on to the next level, doing the applanation or putting the proparacane or the tropical silk plus. Because again, the dryness of the eye is another part that definitely affects the, uh, the biometry and which has been well proved. So as virgin the eye as possible with a lubricant, maybe five minutes before, and to do off the biometry would get give the best of results. However, if at a later stage, if after that uh, Shamas is done and a T-butt is done, and the patient uh, shows up a dry eye. So here again, there's a word of caution that one should wait for the dryness to improve and then redo the biometry to get accurate results. Very good thoughts. Uh, Dr. Paryani, uh, any quick uh, thoughts? Uh, yes, sir. So only sir, two points that yes, uh, Barrett's U2 is uh, universal to is a go-to formula. Uh, so for example, if I, ha I have an IOL Master 500, it doesn't have a Barrett's incorporated. So I use the values and cross check into my online Barrett's U2 uh, to get a proper IOL, for IOL power formula. But at the same time, if I have a dense cataract and I'm doing an immersion for that, when I'm using a Barrett's U2 online, I add up a 0.15 or a 0.2 to the axial length because the Barrett's is being designed for an optical biometry. When I'm using an immersion biometry, I add a 0.10 or 0.20, depending on your outcomes, to uh, add the axial length, to add it to the axial length. And that is the axial length I put in a Barrett's U2 to get the exact IOL power formula. Uh, exact IOL power. Which is true. It is never more. So you don't have to subtract it ever. What Bukesh is saying is correct. If at all you have to add 0.15 or 0.20, you don't have to subtract even if it's a bigger eye or a smaller eye. That, that's an important point that he's mentioning. And the other thing which I learned is 
optical biometry even in alaska or the himalaya or in mumbai or under water consistency is fantastic in any and every machine you cannot go wrong that's that's something very important your dryness doesn't matter so much every which way that is one of the best ways to get your axial length no i said that you know uh, i was just saying the partner made a very important point and uh, uh, the k reading is what is affected when the cornea is inappropriate and if you get an inappropriate the axial length may not be affected and i think parimal also made an extremely important point just in case you are not doing this variation in the axial length if you are using immersion a scan reading as you know there is something called an acoustic a constant and optical a constant and there is usually the optical a constant is about 0.5 doctors more so if you are using an acoustic a, uh, if you are using an immersion a constant and doing a calculation it might be roughly add about 0.5 doctors to your uh, intraocular lens for the basic power that you are getting is another way of dealing with it but the variation the axial length is also a good way to do